How long is it going to be? Then it changes. You can change the name. Huh? Oh, hold on. Thank you. you need to Hello. Hello, everybody. Please, please let me know how the mic level is because I, I have no clue. But, um, yeah. Today, I'm going to be reading a book, There, There, by Tommy Orange. And we're not going to be able to finish the whole thing today, but I want to try and get as much um, progress as I can. Now, my school is being, is reading this book, There, There, taught by Tommy Orange. So, um, I hope you find it useful if your school is also reading it, and if they're not, well, uh, at least I hope you can come along for the ride and enjoy. Give me a sec. So, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna be doing is I've been I've already read the first two chapters, but we're gonna start from the beginning, and I'm gonna be taking notes as well. So hopefully you can read the notes and feel free to pause the live stream, take a a photo of the notes, and yeah, it's all gonna be about the synthesis essays and whatnot, trying to find good quotes. Um, trying to highlight the meaning of certain things and yeah so first thing first I'm gonna need to test my highlighters to make sure okay make sure they don't bleed through and don't worry this is not like a library book okay that bleeds through I should not have that on this page so we only have green I think I think yellow will bleed through too uh, I'm just gonna stick with green. Okay, anyways. So, yeah. Um, prologue. We're gonna start with the prologue first. I'm just gonna get my writing new pencil set. Okay. Here we go. Prologue. In the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. Indian head. There was an Indian head, the head of an Indian, the drawing of the head of a headdress, long-haired Indian depicted, drawn by an unknown artist in 1939 Broadcast until the late 1970s to American TVs everywhere after all the shows ran out. It's called the Indian Head Test Pattern. If you left the TV on, you'd hear a tone at 440 hertz, the tone used to tune instruments, and you'd see the Indian surrounded by circles that look like sights through rifle scopes. That's an important part, the rifle scopes part. Because it's just like how so many this rifle scopes refers to how many Native Americans and Native Canadians were massacred because of the colonial period. So rifle scopes. Take mm -hmm. three during colonial periods. Let's stick that on the top. I actually wrote that wrong, but it's okay. And then we're gonna see if 
Eiffel scopes is the symbol of death. Okay, stick that to the side. Okay. There was what looked like a bullseye in the middle of the screen with numbers like coordinates. The Indian's head was just above the bullseye. Like, all you need to do was not up in agreement to set the sights on the target. This was just a test. So another important thing, nodding up in agreement is just like how it was the norm back in the day. Okay, so it was the norm. There you go. Oops. In 1621, colonists invited Massasoit, probably screw that up, the chief of the Wampanoags, Wampanoags to a feast after a recent land deal. The Mass Massasoit, came, oh, Massasoit came with 90 of his men. That meal is why we still eat a meal together in November, celebrate it as a nation. But that one wasn't a Thanksgiving meal. It was a land deal meal. Two years later, there was another similar meal meant to symbolize eternal friendship. 200 Indians dropped dead that night from an unknown poison. This whole thing is talking about how Thanksgiving is ironically coming from the massacre of a lot of Indians. By the time Massasoit's son, Metacomet, became chief, there were no Indian pilgrims meals. Indian pilgrim meals being eaten together. Metacomet, also known as King Philip, was forced to sign a peace treaty to give up all Indian guns. Three of his men were hanged. His brother, Wamsuta, was, let's say, very likely poisoned after being summoned and seized by the Plymouth Court, all of which led to the first official Indian War, the first war with Indians, King Philip's War. Three years later, the war was over and Metacomet was on the run. He was caught by Benjamin Church, the captain of the very first American Rangers, and an Indian by the name of John Alderman. Metacomet was beheaded and dismembered. Quartered. They tied his four body sections to nearby trees for the birds to pluck. Alderman was given Metacomet's hand, which he kept in a jar of rum, and for years took around with him. Charged people to see it. Metacomet's head was sold to the Plymouth colony for 30 shillings, the going rate for an Indian head at the time. The head was put on a spike, carried through the streets of Plymouth, then displayed at Plymouth Fort for the next 25 years. Wow. Okay. So meta comment was the sun. Oh, sorry. Yes, Metacomet was the son who got dismembered. In 1637, anywhere from four to 700 Pequot gathered for their annual green corn dance. Colonists surrounded their village, set it on fire, and shot any Pequot who tried to escape. The next day, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had a feast and celebration, and the governor declared it a day of Thanksgiving. Thanksgivings like these happened everywhere, whenever there were what we have to call successful massacres. At one such celebration in Manhattan, people were said to have celebrated by kicking the heads of Pequot people through the streets like soccer balls. 
So you can see really how the norm is and how terrible the norm was at the time, but people didn't realize uh, until now. The first novel by a native person and the first novel written in California was written in eight, uh, 1854 by a Cherokee guy named John Roland Ridge. The life and the adventures of Joaquin Murrieta was based on a supposed real-life Mexican bandit from California by the same name, who was killed by a group of Texas Rangers in 1853. To prove they've killed Murrieta, collect the 5,000 reward put on his head, they cut it off. Kept it in a jar of whiskey. They also took the hand of his fellow bandit, Three Fingered Jack. The rangers took Murrieta's head and Jack's hand on a tour throughout California. Charged a few, charged the dollar for the show. You can really see how other people's suffering has been proclaimed uh, and really um, used as entertainment for someone else's benefit. The Indian head in the jar, the Indian head on the spike, were like flags flown, to be seen cast broadly. Just like the Indian head test pattern was broadcast to sleeping Americans as we set sail from our living rooms over the ocean blue-green glowing air airwaves to the shores, the screens of the new world. Rolling head. There's an old Chinian cha Chien. There's an old Chien story about a rolling head. We heard it said there was a family who moved away from their camp, moved near a lake, husband, wife, daughter, and son. In the morning, when the husband finished dancing, he would brush his wife's hair and paint her face red, then go off to hunt. When he came back, her face would be clean. After this happened a few times, he decided to follow her and hide and see what she did while he was gone. He found her in the lake with a water monster, some kind of snake thing, wrapped around her in an embrace. The man cut the monster up and killed his wife. He brought the meat home to his son and daughter. They noticed it tasted different. The son, who was still nursing, said, My mother tastes just like this. His older sister told him it's just deer meat. While they ate, a head rolled in. They ran and the head followed them. The sister remembered where they played, how thick the thorns were there. She brought the thorns to life behind them with her words. But the head broke through, kept coming. Then she remembered where rocks used to be piled in a different way, difficult way. The rocks appeared when she spoke of them, but didn't stop the head. So she drew a hard line in the ground, which made a deep chasm the head couldn't cross. But after a long, heavy rain, the chasm filled with water. The head crossed the water, and when it reached the other side, it turned around and drank all that water up. The rolling head became confused and drunk. It wanted more, more of anything, more of everything, and it just kept rolling. I guess this head, um, but especially about this more of anything, more of anything, and it kept, it just kept rolling, was, could be a reference to two things, to the Indians wanting more freedom, wanting anything as much as they possibly could get, but they just had to just keep. But probably this is more referring to the colonists, how no matter how hard the Native Americans fought back, the colonists just kept gaining more and more land and taking away more and more lives. One thing we should keep in mind moving forward is that no one ever rolled heads down temple stairs. Mel Gibson made that up. but we do have in our minds those of us who saw the movie the heads rolling down temple stairs in a world meant to resemble the real indian world in the 1500s in mexico mexicans before they were mexicans before spain came we've been defined by everyone else and continue to be slandered despite easily to look up on the internet facts about the realities of our histories and current state of the people so really, this is talking a lot about misinformation, and that's something I'm actually going to write down because it's very important. Misinformation plus stereotypes. And this is really a big problem that society faces and for sure could be a prompt that is used in some kind of in class essay. Anyways, where was I? Ooh. 
we have the sad, defeated Indian silhouette and the heads rolling down Temple Stairs. We have it in our heads. Kevin Costner saving us, John Wayne Six Shooter slaying us, an Italian guy named Iron Eyes Cody playing our parts in movies. We have the litter mourning, tear ridden Indian in the commercial, also Iron Eyes Cody, and the sink tossing crazy Indian who was the n narrator in the novel, the voice of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We have all the logos and mascots, the copy of a copy of the image of an Indian in a textbook. All the way from the top of Canada, the top of Alaska, down to the bottom of South America, Indians were removed, then reduced to a feathered image. So this is really talking about misappropriation. Which is using, or like cultural, cultural appropriation. Yeah, so this is using some other person's culture in a stereotypical way without, you know, having respect for it, really. And abusing it, I guess. Our heads are on flags, jerseys, and coins. Our heads were on the penny first, of course, the Indian scent, and then on the buffalo nickel, both before we could even vote as people. Which, like the truth of what happened in history all over the world, and like all that spilled blood was slaughtered, are now out of circulation. Massacre as prologue. Some of us grew up with stories about massacre, stories about what happened to our people not so long ago, how we came out of it. At Sand Creek, we heard it said that they mowed us down with their howitzers. Volunteer militia under Colonel John Shivington, Shivington came to kill us. We were mostly women, children, and elders. The men were away to hunt. They told us to fly the American flag. We flew that and a white flag too. Surrender. The white flag waved. We stood under both flags as they came to at us. They did more than kill us. They tore us up, mu mutilated us, broke our fingers to take our rings, Cut off our ears to take our silver, sculpted us for our hair. We hid in the hollows of tree trunks, buried ourselves in sand by the river bank. This is really talking about the desperation. That same sand ran red with blood. Okay, I'm going to highlight. They did more than kill us. They tore unborn babies out of bellies. Took what we intended to be our children before they were children, babies before they were babies. They ripped them out of our bellies. They broke soft baby heads against trees. Then took our own. They, then they took our body parts as trophies and displayed them on a stage in downtown Denver. Colonel Shivington danced with dismembered parts of us in his head with woman's pubic hair. Drunk, he danced, and the crowd gathered there before him was all the worse for cheering and laughing along with him. It was a celebration. Hard fast. Getting us to cities was supposed to be the final necessary step in our assimilation, absorption, erasure, the completion of a 500 year old genocidal campaign. But the city made us new, and we made it ours. We didn't get lost amid the sprawl of tall buildings, the streams of anonymous masses, the ceaseless din of traffic. We found one another, started up Indian centers, brought out our families and powwows, our dances, our songs, our beadwork. This is really talking about here, the, the uh, recovery method of trying to recover lost culture and such other things. We bought and rented homes, slept on the streets, on the freeways, we went to school, joined the armed forces, populated Indian bars in the fruit bale in Oakland, and in the mission in San Francisco. We lived in boxcar villages in Richmond. We made art, and we made babies, and we made way for our people to go back and forth between reservation and city. We did not move to cities to die. The sidewalks and streets, the concrete, absorbed our heaviness. The glass, metal, rubber, and wires, the speed, the hurling masses, the city took us in. We were not urban Indians then. This was part of the Indian Re Re Relocation Act. 
which was part of the Indian termination policy, which was and is exactly what it sounds like. Make them look and act like us, become us, and so disappear. But it wasn't just like that. Plenty of us came by choice. Sorry, so what is this talking about? This is ta part about... About trying to change Indians into becoming more urbanized, more American, I suppose. But it wasn't just like that. Plenty of us came by choice to start over to make money or for a new experience. Some of us came to cities to escape the reservation. Obviously, you know, we know that reservations were terrible. I mean, they lacked energy, um, water, and the living conditions were really terrible. We stayed after fighting in the Second World War, after Vietnam too. We stayed because the city sounds like a war, and you can't leave a war once you've been. You can only keep it at bay, which is easier when you can see and hear it near you. That fast metal, that constant firing around you, cars up and down the streets and freeways like bullets. The quiet of the reservation, the side of the highway towns, rural communities, that kind of silence just makes the sound of your brain on fire that much more pronounced. Kind of like, once you get into the city, there's no leaving the city. You've become uh, part of the urban life. Mm -hmm. Plenty of us are urban now. If not because we live in cities, then because we live on the internet. Inside the high rise of multiple browser windows. They used to call us sidewalk Indians. Called us citified, superficial, inauthentic, cultureless refugees, apples. An apple is red on the outside and one on the inside. But what we are is what our ancestors did. How they survived. We are the memories we don't remember, which live in us, which we feel, which make us sing and dance and pray the way we do. Feelings. Mm -mm. From memories that flare and bloom unexpectedly in our lives like blood through a blanket from a wound made by a bullet fired by a man shooting us in the back of for our hair, for our heads, for a bounty, or just to get rid of us. This is really saying that the uh, this is trying basically trying to recover from the terrible acts and deeds of the colonizers. Once again, it's just a repeat message throughout the whole prologue. When they first came for us with their bullets, we didn't stop moving even. Though the bullets move twice as fast as the sound of our screams, and even when their heat and speed broke our skin, shattered our bones, skulls pierced our heart, we kept on. Even when we saw the bullets send our bodies flailing through the air like flags, like the many flags and buildings that went up in place of everything we knew this land to be before. It's also talking about the colonizers taking the land away from them, just like they took their lives away from them. The bullets were premonitions, ghosts from dreams of a hard, fast future. How all of this colonization came really quickly and was basically not preventable because there was just too much of a power gap between colonizers and the Native Americans. Um, the bullets moved on after moving through us became the promise of what was to come, the speed and the killing, the hard, fast lines of borders and buildings. They took everything and ground it down to the dust as fine as gunpowder. They fired their guns into the air in victory and strays flew out in the nothingness of histories written wrong and meant to be forgotten. Stray bullets and consequences are landing on our unexpected, unsuspecting bodies even now. Excuse me. Urbanity. Urban Indians were the generation born in the city. We've been moving for a long time, but the land moves with you like memory. An urban Indian belongs to the city, and cities belong to the earth. Everything here is formed in relation to every other thing, every other living and non-living thing from the earth. All our relations, the process that brings anything to its current form, chemical, synthetic, 
technological or otherwise doesn't make the product not a product of the living earth. Buildings, freeways, cars, are these not of the earth? Were they shipped in from Mars, the moon? Is it because they're processed, manufactured, or that we handle them? Are we so different? Were we at one time not something else entirely? Homo sapiens, single-celled organisms, space dust, unidentifiable pre-bang quantum theory. Cities form in the same way as galaxies. So we're talking about here how really segregation is coming from the human thinking, but there's no biological difference between people. People are all the same. And so this idea of race and separating people because of race is pretty absurd, which I mean, it's pretty, hopefully, it's um, an idea, a concept that is uh, what most people agree with. Okay. Urban Indians feel at home walking in the shadow of a downtown building. We came to know the downtown Oakland skyline better than we did any sacred mountain range. The redwoods in the Oakland Hills better than any other deep wild forest. We know the sound of the freeway better than we do rivers, the howl of distant trains better than wolf howls. We know the smell of gas and freshly wet concrete and burned rubber better than we do the smell of cedar or sage or even fry bed bread, which isn't traditional, like reservations aren't traditional, but nothing is original. Everything comes from something that came before, which was once nothing. Just so talking about how yeah, these cities, people nowadays uh, are moving away from tradition and especially people uh, that were born in the city um, don't really know the way of their past anymore or are a little bit disconnected, but they're trying to recover um, because of the impacts of, once again, uh, the colonizers and also talking about how colonizers um, how how Native Americans were the original people here and colonizers took their land from them. Everything is new and doomed. We ride buses, trains, and cars across, over, and under concrete plains. Being Indian has never been about returning to the land. The land is everywhere or nowhere. So we're talking about how now Native Americans have to adapt to life in the modern day world. This is important. How can I not know today your face tomorrow? The face that is there already or is being forged beneath the face you show me or beneath the mask you are wearing and which you will only show me when I am least expecting it. This is talking about how people wear masks to hide their true identities and a lot of times that can backlash at them and people can't learn about each other um, honestly, because of all the masks people are wearing. Tony Loneman, the drone first came to me in the mirror when I was six. So context, the drone is um, alcohol s syndrome where Tony Loneman's mom drank way too much alcohol that um, when Tony Loneman was born, he came with a deformity in his face. And he's also it also impacted his critical thinking and mental health and oftentimes he's slow and dyslexic. The drone first came to me in the mirror when I was six. Earlier that day my friend Mario, while hanging from the monkey bars in the sand bar sand park, said, Why does your face look like that? I don't remember what I did. I still don't know. I remember smears of blood on the metal and the taste of metal in my mouth. I remember, I remember my grandma, Maxine, shaking my shoulder in the hall outside the principal's office. My eyes closed, her making this psh sound. She always makes me try to explain myself and shouldn't. I remember her pulling my harm, arm harder than she'd ever pull it, then the quiet drive home. Back home in front of the TV, before I turned it on, I saw my face in the dark reflection there. It was the first time I saw it, my own face. The way everyone else saw it. When I asked Maxine, she told me my mom drank when I was in her. She told me real slow that I have fatal alcohol syndrome. All I heard her say was drone. And then I was back in front of the turned off TV. Staring at it. My face stretched across the screen. 
the drone. I tried but couldn't make the face that I found there my own again. Most people don't have to think about what their face means the way I do. Your face in the mirror reflected back at you. Most people don't even know what it looks like anymore. The thing on the front of your head. You'll never see it. Like you'll never see your own eyeball with your own eyeball. Like you'll never smell what you smell like. But me, I know what my face looks like. I know what it means. My eyes droop like I'm effed up. Like I'm high and my mouth hangs open all the time. There's too much space between each of the parts of my face, eyes, nose, mouth, spread out like a drunk slapped it on reaching for another drink. People look at me then look people look at me then look away when they see I see them see me. That's the drone too. My power and curse. The drone is my mom and why she drank. It's the way history lands on a face. And all the ways I made it so far, despite how it has effed with me since the day I found it there on TV, staring back at me like an effing villain. I'm 21 now, which means I can drink if I want. I don't though. The way I see it, I got enough when I was a baby in my mom's stomach, getting drunk in there. A drunk effing baby. Not even a baby. A little effing tadpole thing, hooked up to a cord, floating in a stomach. They told me I'm stupid. Not like that. They didn't say it like that. But I basically failed the intelligence test. The lowest percentile. That bottom rung. My friend Karen told me they got all kinds of intelligences. She's my counselor. I still see once a week over at the Indian Center. I was at first mandatory to go after the incident with Mario in kindergarten. Karen told me I don't have to worry about what they tried to tell me about intelligence. She said people with FAS are on a spectrum, have a wide range of intelligences, that the intelligence test is biased, and that I got strong intuition and street smarts that I'm smart where it counts, which I already knew, but when she told me it felt good, like I didn't really know it until she said it like that. Nothing too important to say here, it's just context, so just remember that Tony has um, fatal alcohol syndrome, and he struggles with that. I'm smart, like, I know what people have in mind, what they mean when they say they mean another thing. The drone taught me to look past the first look people give you, find that other one right behind it. All you gotta do is wait a second longer than you normally do and you can catch it. You can see what they got in mind back there. I know if someone's selling around me. I know Oakland. I know what it looks like when somebody's trying to come up on me. Like when to cross the street and when to look at the ground and keep walking. I know how to spot a scared cat too. That one's easy. They wear their, they wear that shit like there's a sign in their head. The sign says, come get me. They look at me like I already did some shit. So I might as well do the shit they're looking for at me like that for. So he's talking about how he's got issues, but he's making it up. But making it up. via alternate springs and also embracing a little a little bit only though <laughs> so I'm gonna hike this part Maxim told me I'm a medicine person. She said people like me are rare and that when we come along, people better know we look different because we are different. To respect that, I never got no kind of respect from nobody, though, except Maxine. She tells me we're chain people. The Indians go way back with the land. That all this was once ours. All this. Shit. 
They must not have had street smart street smarts back then. Let them white men come over come over here and take it from them like that. The sad part is all those Indians probably knew but couldn't do anything about it. That's the truth. And they have guns, plus the diseases. That's what Maxine said. Cut us with the white men's dirt and diseases. Moved us off our land. Moved us in onto some shit land you can't grow fucking shit on. Oops, I didn't mean to swear there. <laughs> Effing shit on. I would hate it if I got a move if I got moved out of Oakland because I know it so well. From west to east to deep east and back on bike or bus or bark. It's my only home. I wouldn't make it in nowhere else. So really this here is him kind of getting empathy with his ancestors and you know also empathy with the readers because imagine if you got kicked out of your homeland after knowing it so well I mean the the um, Native Americans back then they knew the the forests and the lands and the rivers like the back of a hand now I don't know what the back of my hand looks like, but I'm sure they did. <laughs> Sometimes I ride my bike all over Oakland just to see it. The people, all its different hoods. With my headphones on, listening to MF Doom, I can ride all day. The MF stands for Metal Face. He's my favorite rapper. Doom wears a metal mask and calls himself a villain. Before Doom, I didn't know nothing but what came on the radio. Somebody left their iPod on the seat in front of me on the bus. Doom was the only music on there. I knew I liked him when I heard the line. Got more soul than a sock with a hole. Got more soul than a sock with a hole. It's important. It's talking about how people always have a story even after being abused. What I like is that I understood all the meanings to it right away. Like instantly. I meant, it meant soul. Like having a hole in a sock is a sock character means it's worn through, gives it a soul, and also like the bottom of your foot showing through to the sole of your foot. It's a small thing, but it made me feel like I'm not stupid, not slow, not bottom run, and it helped because the drones would give me my soul, and the drone is a face worn through. So yeah, this is true. The drone is what gives him his soul. It's talking about how the his syndrome is giving him, you know, unique identity, I guess, and he's embracing it. My mom's in jail. We talk sometimes on the phone, but she's always saying some shit that makes me wish we didn't. She told me my dad's over in New Mexico, that he doesn't even know I exist. Tell that mother effer I exist, I said to her. Tony, it ain't simple like that, she said. Don't call me simple. Don't effing call me simple. You effing did this to me. So yeah, he's still angry at his mom for doing this. Sometimes I get mad. That's what happens to, to my intelligence sometimes. No matter how many times Maxine moved me from schools, I got suspended from for getting in fights. It's always the same. I get mad and then I don't know anything. My face heats up and hardens like it's made of metal. Then I black out. I'm a big guy. I'm strong. Too strong, Maxine tells me. The way I see it, I got this big body to help me since my face got it so bad. That's how it look how looking like a monster works out for me. The drone. And when I stand up, when I stand up real F and tall like I can, nobody will F with me. Everybody runs like you see the ghost. Maybe I am a ghost. Maybe Maxine doesn't even know who I am. Maybe I'm the opposite of a medicine person. Maybe I'ma do something one day and everybody's gonna know about me. Maybe that's when I'll come to life. Maybe that's when they'll finally be able to look at me. Cause they'll have to. This is really talking, very, very important passage right here. This is super important passage. It's really talking about how his anger kind of is used as a cover-up for his face. You know, he, 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 he fights in a way that, 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 that makes him mad because of his face. And this is kind of like a mask. Strength is a mask to cover up 
his face. His insecurities, really. And, yeah, this is really important as well. Because it's talking about how... Making people finally look at him. He wants to be something. Be something special. Someone that is known. Not looked down upon. That's what he wants to be. Somebody that people will respect, I guess. And he's going to force it no matter what. Everyone's going to think it's about the money. But who doesn't want effing want... Who doesn't effing want money? It's about why you want money. How you get it. Then what you do with it that matters. Money did never do shit to no one. That's people. I've been selling weed since I was 13. Met some homies on the block by just being outside all the time. They probably thought I was already selling the way. I was outside. I was always outside on corners and shit. But then maybe not. If they thought I was selling, they probably would have beat my ass. Probably felt sorry for me. Shitty clothes, shitty face. I give most of the money I get from selling to Maxine. This is showing his empathy. His empathy, his kind heart, and also talks about the mask. How his face and his strength it uses the max mask to cover up his humility, his empathy. Mask covering up covers up his essentially his soft side. And empathy. And also, wait, I spelled empathy wrong, sorry. Also, and selflessness. Very 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 messy writing <laughs> sorry about that damn I've been streaming for an hour and I've only got 20 pages that is pretty pretty bad <laughs> I tried to help her in whatever ways I can because she lets me live at her house over in West Oakland in the end of 14th which she bought a long time ago when she worked as a nurse in San Francisco. Now she needs a nurse, but she can't afford one even with the money she gets from Social Security. She needs me to do all kinds of shit for her. Go to the store, ride the bus with her to get her meds. I walk with her down the stairs now too. I can't believe a bone can get so old it can shatter, break into tiny pieces in your body like glass. After she broke her hip, I started helping out more. Maxine makes me read to her before she goes to sleep. I don't like it because I read slow. The letters move on me sometimes, like bugs. Just whenever they want, they switch places. But then sometimes the words don't move. When they stay still like that, I have to wait to be sure they're not going to move. So it ends up taking longer for me to read than the ones I can put back together after they scramble. Maxine makes me read her Indian stuff that I, always, that I don't always get. I like it though, because when I do get it, it gets... I get it way down at that place where it hurts but feels better because you feel it. Something you couldn't feel before reading it. That makes you feel be feel less alone and like it's not going to hurt as much anymore. One time she used the word devastating after I finished reading a passage from her fav favorite author, Louise Erdrich. It was something about how life will break you. How that's the reason we're here. And to go sit. by an apple tree and listen to the apples fall and pile around you, wasting all that sweetness. I didn't know what I meant then, and she saw that I didn't. She didn't explain it either, but we read the passage, the, that whole book, 
another time, and I got it. So, so this maybe is talking about second chances as well. Maxine's always known me and been able to read me like no one else can, better than myself even. Like I don't even know all that I'm showing to the world. Like I'm reading my own reality slow because of the way things switch around on me, how people look at me and treat me, and how long it takes me to figure out if I have to put it all back together. How all this came about all the shit I got in is because these white boys from up in the Oakland Hills came up on me in a liquor store parking lot in West Oakland, straight up like they weren't afraid of me. I could tell they were scared of being there in that neighborhood from the way they kept their heads on a swivel, why they weren't afraid of me. It was like they thought I wasn't going to do some shit because of how I look. Like I'm too slow to do shit. You got Snow, the one as tall as me in the Kangol hat ass. I wanted to laugh. It was so effing white for them to use the word snow for coke. I can get it, I said, even though I wasn't sure if I could. Come back here in a week, same time. I would ask Carlos. Carlos was hella flaky. The night he was supposed to get it, he called me and told me he couldn't make it and that I'd have to get go to Oct Octavio to get it myself. I rode my bike over from the Col Coliseum BART station. Octavia's house was in deep East Oakland of 73rd, across from where the Eastmont Hotel used to be until things got so bad that they turned it into a police station. When I got there, people were pouring out of the house into the street like there'd been a fight. I sat back on my bike from a block away for a while, watching the drunks move around under the glow of the street lights, all stupid like moss drunk on light. When I found Octavio, he was all kinds of effed up. It always made me think of my mom when I see people like that. I wonder what she was like drunk when I was in her. Did she like it? Did I? Octavio was pretty clear headed though, even though he even through, sorry, even through the heavy slur, he put his arm around me and took me to his backyard where he had a bench press set up under a tree. I watched him do sets with a bar without weights on it. I th it didn't seem like he realized there were no weights. I waited to see when he would ask a question about my face, but he didn't. I listened to him about talk about his grandma, about how he would save his life after his family was gone. Oh, sorry, about how she saved his life after his family was gone. So he's talking about how he, he, he's actually being quite open, this Octavio guy. He said she'd lift a curse from him with badger, ba badger fur, and that she called anyone not Mexican or Indian Gachupins which is a disease that the Spanish brought to the natives when they came. She used to tell him that the Spanish were the disease that they brought. She told, he told me he never meant to become what he'd become, and I wasn't sure what that was, a drunk or a drug dealer or both or something else. I'd give away my own heart's blood for her, Octavio said. His, this is for sure very heartfelt. Important. His own heart's blood. That's the way I felt about Maxine. This is also, you know, these people are always going through a hard time, but there's always this person that they really care about and would do anything for them. He told me he didn't mean to sound all sensitive and shit, but that nobody else ever really listened to him. I knew it was because he was effed up, and that he probably wouldn't remember shit. But after that, I went straight to Octavio for everything. It turns out those goofy white boys from the hills had friends. Make good money for a summer. Then one day, when I was picking up, Octavio asked me in, told me to sit down. You're native, right? He said. Yeah, I said. I wondered how he knew. Che, Cheyenne. Tell me what a powwow is, he said. Why? 
just tell me. Maxine has had been taking me to powwows all around the bay since I was young. I don't anymore, but I used to dance. We dress up Indian, the feathers and beads and shit. We dance, sing, and beat this big drum, buy and sell Indian shit like jewelry and clothes and all that. I said, "Yeah, but what do you do it for?" Octavia said, "Money." I said, "No, but really, why do they do it?" I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? To make money, Mother Effort, I said. Octavia looked at me with his head sideways, like, remember who you're talking to. That's why we're going to be at that powwow, too, Octavia said. The one they're having over at the Coliseum? Yeah, to make money. Octavia nodded. So this is important as well, because... He doesn't... Either this is a mask... Pretty sure this is a more of a mask. Masking. Cultural. Identity. In public. For fear. Of. Re. Pre. So, um, it's pretty clear that Tony is scared of saying that it's because he wants to respect his culture. That's why they did the powwows and stuff because that might make him look weaker. Hmm. Tyler nodded and turned around and picked up what I couldn't tell at first was a gun. It was small and all white. What the f is that? I said. Plastic. Octavio said. It works? It's 3D printed. You want to see? He said. See, I said. Out in the backyard. Oops. Yeah. Out in the backyard, I aimed the gun at a can of Pepsi on the string with two hands. My tongue out and one eye closed. One eye closed. You ever fired a gun before? He said. No, I said. Shit, it'll make your ears ring. Can I? I said. And before I got an answer, I felt my fingers squeeze and then the boom go through me. There was a moment when I didn't know what was happening. The squeeze brought the sound of the boom, and my whole body became a boom and a drop. I ducked without meaning to. There was a ring inside and out. A single tone, drifting far off, or deep inside. I looked at Octavio and saw that he was saying something. I said, what? I couldn't even hear myself say it. This is how we're going to rob that powwow, I finally heard Octavio say. I remember there were metal detectors at the entrance of the Coliseum. Maxine's walker, the one she used after she broke her hip, it set one of them off. Me and Maxine went on a Wednesday night, dollar night, to see the A's play the Texas Rangers, which was the team Maxine grew up rooting for in Oklahoma because Oklahoma didn't have a team. On the way out, Octavio handed me a flyer for the powwow that listed the prize money in each dance category. Four for five thousand, three for ten. That's good money, I said. I wouldn't be getting into some shit like this, but I owe somebody, Octavio said. Who? Mind your business, Octavio said. We good, I said. Go home, Octavio said. The night before the powwow, Octavio called me and told me I was going to have to be the one to hide the bullets. In the bushes for real, I said. Yeah, I'm supposed to throw bullets into the bushes at the entrance, put them in a sock. Put bullets in the sock and throw them in the bushes. Remember, sock, sock. Where did we see sock? Sock is like the sock. The worn sock in the, in the music, remember? That has soul. Yeah, so. Because he's doing this, he's losing the soul. He's throwing the sock away, right? so he's like throwing his soul away, I guess. 
which makes sense because he's participating in this. Put bullets in the sock and throw them in the bushes? What did I say? It just seems, what? Nothing. You got it? Where do I get bullets? What kind? Walmart. Point twenty twos. Can you just print them? They can't do that yet. Alright. Here's one more thing, Octavio said. Yeah, you still got some Indian shit to put on. What do you mean Indian shit? I don't know. What they put on. Feathers and shit. Stereotype, maybe? Put a question mark. I got it. You're gonna wear it. It won't even barely fit, but will it? Yeah. Wear it to the powwow. Alright, I said and hung up. I pulled my regalia out and put it on. I went out into the living room and stood in front of the TV. It was the only place in the house I could see my whole body. I shook and lifted a foot. I watched the feathers flooded on the screen. I put my arms out and dipped my shoulders down. Then I walked up to the TV. I tied in my chin strap. I looked at my face, the drum. I didn't see it there. I saw an Indian. I saw a dancer. This is such an important thing as well. The whole last thing, especially about seeing an Indian and not seeing the drum, seeing a dancer. And this kind of relates back to the Indian head back in the beginning on the TV about how um, public perceive natives differently. from themselves. And what I mean by this is I can actually write properly. Because like in the TV, the Indian head was really, it was kind of cultural appropriation. But here, this is a real Indian doing real dances and this is what it actually was. But he's the only one that can see in the TV, whereas the display on the TV is sent to everybody. And that's kind of like, that's why the public consensus is different from reality. I'm going to take a quick break and get some water, and then I'll be back. Okay, guys, um, yeah, I'm sorry to do this. I'm gonna skip being oxidine because I'm on a little bit of a tight timeline, but Dean um, Dean is not as related for now to the story. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip for a little bit and come back to it.
later. In my next stream, sorry. Okay. Opal, Viola, Victoria, Bear Shield. What a name. Me and my sister, Jackie, were doing our homework in the living room with the TV on when our mom came home with the news that we'd be moving to Alcatraz. <sighs> Pack your things, we're going there, over there, today, our mom said, and we knew what she meant. We'd been over there to celebrate, not celebrating, saying Thanksgiving. Back then, we lived in East Oakland in a yellow house. It was the brightest but smallest house on the block. Oh, by the way, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read. I'm not gonna do notes anymore for now. <coughs> Sorry. It was the brightest but smallest house on the block. A two bedroom with a tiny kitchen that couldn't even fit a table. I didn't live it there. The carpets were too thin and smelled like dirt and smoke. We didn't have a couch or TV at first, but it was definitely better than where we were before. One morning, our mom woke us up in a hurry. Her face was beat up. She had a brown leather jacket, way too big for her draped, way too big for her draped over her shoulders. Both her top and bottom lips were swollen. Seeing those big lips messed up, she couldn't talk right. She told us to pack her things then too. Jackie's last name is Redfeather, and mine is Bearfield. Okay. Both our dads had left our mom. Both our dads had left our mom. That morning, our mom came home beat up, and we took we took the bus to a new house, the yellow house. I don't know how she got us a house. On the bus, I moved closer to my mom and put a hand in her jacket pocket. Why do we got names like we do? I said. They come from old Indian names. We had our own way of naming before white people came over and spread all those dad names around in order to keep the power with the dads. I understand it. I didn't understand the explanation about dads. And I didn't know what bear shield meant. Shields that bears used to protect themselves. Or shield people used to protect themselves against bears. Or were the shields themselves made out of bears. Either way, it was all pretty hard to explain in school. But how I was a bear, bear shield... And that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was my first name, which was which was two, Opal Viola. That makes me Opal Viola Victoria Bearshield. Victoria was our mom's name, even though she went by Vicky. And Opal Viola came from our grandma, who we never met. Our mom told us she was a medicine woman and renowned singer of spiritual songs. So I was supposed to carry that big old name around with honor. The good thing was, the kids didn't have to do anything to my name just to make fun of me. No rhymes or variations. They just said the whole thing and it was funny. Got on a bus on a cold gray morning in late January 1970. Me and Jackie had matching beat up old red duffel bags that didn't hold much. But we didn't have much. I packed two outfits and tucked my teddy, teddy bear two shoes under my arm. The name two shoes came from my sister because her childhood teddy bear only had one shoe the way she they got it. Her bear wasn't named one shoe, but maybe I should have considered myself lucky to have a bear with two shoes and not just one. But then bears don't wear shoes, so maybe I wasn't lucky either with something else. Out on the sidewalk, our mom turned to face the house Say goodbye to it, girls. I'd gotten used to keeping an eye on the front door. I'd seen more than a few eviction notices. And sure enough, one was right there. Our mom always kept them up so she could claim she never saw them in order to buy time. Me and Jack looked up at the house. It'd been okay, the yellow house, for what it was. The first one we'd been in without either of the dads, so it'd been quiet even sweet, like the banana cream pie our mom made the first night we spent there when the gas worked but the electric electricity had been turned on yet 
and we ate standing up in the kitchen in the candlelight. We were thinking of what we should, what to say when our mom yelled "bus," and we had to scamper after her, dragging our matching red duffel bags behind us. It was the middle of the day, so hardly anyone was on the bus. Jackie sat a few seats back like she didn't know us, like she was riding alone. I wanted to ask my mom more about the island, but I knew she didn't like to talk on the bus. She turned like Jackie, like we all didn't know each other. So I think the context is Jackie's a little bit older and she's like wants to be more independent. While Opa Viola wants to, is more of a mother's girl I guess. Why should, why should we speak our business around people we don't even know, she'd say. After a while, I can't take anymore. Mom, I said, what are we doing? We're going to be with our relatives, Indians of all tribes. We're, gonna, we're going over to where they built the, that prison. We're going to start from the inside of the cell, which is where we are now, Indian people. That's where they got us, even though they don't make it seem like they got us here. We're going to work our way from the inside with a spoon. Here, look at this. She handed me a laminated card from her purse the size of a, size of a playing card. It was, the, it was that picture you could see everywhere. The sad Indian on a one horse silhouette. And on the other side it said Crazy Horse Prophecy. It read, Upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again and it shall be a blessing for a sick world. A world filled with broken promises, selfishness and separations. A world longing for light again. I see a time... Of seven I asked her if there would be monkeys. I thought for some reason that all islands had monkeys. She didn't answer my question. She just smiled and watched the long gray Oakland streams streets stream by the bus windows like it was an old movie she liked but had seen too many times to, to, to notice anymore. A speedboat took us to the island. I kept my head in my mom's lap the whole time. The guys who brought us over here over were dressed in military uniforms. I didn't know what we were getting into. We are, we ate watery beef stew out of styrofoam bowls around a bonfire. Some of the younger men kept pretty big and hot with chunks of wood pallets. Our mom smoked cigarettes farther out from the fire with two Big old Indian women with loud laughs. There were stacks of Wonder Bread and butter on tables with pots of stew. When the fire got too hot, we moved back and sat down. I, I don't know about you, I said to Jackie, my mouth full of bread and butter, but I could live like this. We laughed and Jackie leaned into me. We accidentally knocked heads, which made us laugh more. It got late and I was dozing when our mom came back over, uh, over to us. Everyone's sleeping in cells. It's warmer. She told us. Me and Jackie slept in the cell across from our mom. She had always been crazy, in and out of work, moving us all over Oakland, in and out of our dad's lives, in and out of different schools, in and out of shelters. But this was different. We'd always end up in a house, in a room, in a bed at least. Me and Jackie slept close on Indian blankets in that old jail cell across from my mom. Everything that made the sound in those cells echoed a hundred times over. Our mom sang the ch chain lullaby she used to sing to put us to sleep. I hadn't heard it in so long, I'd almost forgotten it. And even though it echoed like crazy all over the walls, it was the echo of our mom's voice. We still fell asleep quickly and slept soundly. The cells kind of represent the Indians getting trapped. Jackie got a lot better than me. She fell in with a group of teenagers that ran all over the island. The adults were so busy that there was no way for them to keep track. I hung by my mom's side. We went around talking to people, attending official meetings for where everyone tried to agree on what to do, what to ask for, and what our demands would be. The most important seeming intel Indians tended to get mad more easily. These were the men. 
The women weren't listened to as much as our mom would have liked. Those first days went by like weeks. It felt like we were going to stay out there for good, get the feds to build us a school and medical faculty cultural center. At some point though, my mom told me to go out and see what Jackie was up to. I didn't want to go out there alone, but eventually I got bored enough and went out to see what I could find. I took two shoes with me. I know I'm too old to have him. I'm almost 12, but I took him anyway. I went down to the other side of the lighthouse, where it seemed like you weren't supposed to go. I found them by the shore closest to the Golden Gate. They were all over the rocks, pointing at each other and laughing in that wild, cruel way teenagers have about them. I told Two Shoes it probably wasn't such a good idea and that we should just go back. Sister, you don't have to worry. All these people, even these young ones over here, they're all our relatives, so don't be scared. Plus, if anyone comes after you, I'll jump down and bite their ankles. They would never expect that. I'll use my sacred bear medicine on them. I'll put them to sleep. I'll be in like instantaneous hibernation. That's what I'll do, sister. So don't worry. Creator made me strong to protect you, Two Shoes said. I don't know what you mean by talking like an Indian, he said. Oh, sorry. I told Two Shoes to stop talking like an Indian. I don't know what you mean by talking like an Indian, he said. I guess it's like talking to the bear is like um, a mask of trying to face reality or some kind of coping method. You're not an Indian TS, you're a teddy bear. You know, we're not so different. Both of us, both of us got our names from pig brain to men. Pig brain? Men with pigs for brains. Oh, meaning? Columbus called you Indians. For us, it was Teddy Roosevelt's fault. How? He was hunting bear one time, but then found this real scraggy old hungry bear and he refused to shoot it. Then in the newspaper, there was a comic about that hunting story that made it seem like Mr. Roosevelt was merciful, a real nature lover, that kind of thing. Then they made the little stuffed bear and named it Teddy's Bear. Teddy's bear became Teddy Bear. What they didn't say was that he slit that old bear's throat. It's that kind of mercy they don't want you to know about. And how do you know about any of this? You gotta know about the history of your people. How you got to be here. It's all based on what people done to get you here. As bears, you Indians, we've been through a lot. They tried to kill us, but then when you hear them tell it, they make history seem like one big heroic adventure across an empty forest. There were bears and Indians all over the place. Sister, they slit all our throats. All colonialism here. Sorry, I'm kind of... Just highlight that because that's very important. Why do I feel like mom told us all of this already? I said. Roosevelt said, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians. Wait, who is Roosevelt? Is this Teddy? Oh, yeah, it is Teddy. Roosevelt said, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every ten are. And I should, shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the 10th. Damn, T.S., that's messed up. I only heard that, the one about the big stick. That big stick is the lie about mercy. Speak softly and carry a big stick. That's what he said about foreign policy. That's what they used, they used on us, bears and Indians both, foreigners on our own land. And with their big sticks, they marched us so far west, we almost disappeared. Then Two Shoes went quiet. That's the way it, it was with him. He either had something to say, or he didn't. I could tell by what kind of shine I saw in the back, black of his eyes, which one it was. I put Two Shoes behind some rocks and headed down to my sister. They all gathered on a small, wet, sandy beach filled with rocks that thinned out or were covered 
where the water got deeper. The closer I got to them, the more I noticed Jackie was acting weird, all loud and crooked looking. I w she was nice to me. Too nice. She called me over, hugged me too hard, then introduced me to the group as her baby sister in a too loud voice. I lied and told everyone I was 12. But they didn't hear me. I saw that they were passing a ball around. It just got into Jackie. She drank long and hard from it. This is Harvey, Jackie said to me as she knocked the bottle into his arm. Harvey took the bottle and didn't seem to notice Jackie had said anything. I walked away from them and saw that there was a boy standing apart from everyone else who looked like he could have been closer to my age. He was throwing rocks. I asked him what he was doing. What does it look like, he said. Like you're trying to get rid of the island one rock at a time, I said. I wish I could throw this stupid island into the ocean. It's already in the ocean. I meant down to the bottom, he said. Why is that, I said. Because my dad's making me and my brother be over here. Oh, because my dad's making me and my brother be over here, he said. Pull, it, pull this out of school. No TV, no good food. Everyone's running around, drinking, talking about how everyone's everything's going to be different. It's different, all right. And it was better when we were home. Don't you think it's good we're standing up for something? Trying to make things right for what they've done all these hundreds of years since they came? Yeah, yeah. It's all my dad ever talks about. What they've done to us. The U.S. government. I don't know nothing about all that. I just want to go home. I don't think we even have a house anymore. What's so good about taking over some stupid place no one wants to be? A place where people have been trying to escape from since they made it. I don't know. It might help. You never know. Yeah, he said. Then he threw a pretty big rock over by where the older kids were. It splashed them and they yelled curse words at us I didn't recognize. What's your name? I said. Rocky, he said. So Rocky throwing the rocks in, I said. Shut up. What's your name? I regretted having drawing attention to names and trying to think of something else to say. But nothing came. Opal V... Viola, Victoria, Bear Shield. I said as fast as he could. Rocky just threw another rock. I didn't know if he wasn't listening or if he didn't find it funny like most kids did. I didn't get to find out either because just then a boat came rolling up from out of nowhere. Some of the older kids had stolen it from somewhere else on the island. Everyone walked towards the boat as they approached. Me and Rocky followed. You gonna go, I said to Rocky. Yeah, I'll probably go, he said. I said Jackie to ask if sh she was going. F yeah, she said, completely drunk, which was when I knew I had to go. The water got choppy right away. Rocky asked me if I would, if, if he could hold my hand. The question made my heart beat even faster than it was already beating from being on that boat and going so fast with all these older kids who had probably never driven a boat in their whole lives. I grabbed Rocky's hand when we went up high off of the crest of a wave, and we kept our hands held like that until we saw another boat coming toward us, at which point we broke our hold as if catching us holding hands was why the boat was coming. It's quite a lot of reading. <laughs> At first I thought it was the police, but soon I realized just a couple of the older men who ran another boat back and forth between the island and the mainland for supplies. They were screaming something at us. The men forced our bo boat to the front of the island. <laughs> It was only when they docked that I could really hear the screaming. We were being yelled at. All the older kids were pretty drunk. Jackie and Harvey took off running, which inspired everyone else to do the same. Me and Rocky stayed on the boat, watching the older guys scramble to do something about everyone falling and running and laughing that stupid drunk laugh about nothing. When the two men realized that they weren't going to catch anyone and that no one was going to listen, they left, either because they gave up or to get help. The sun was setting and a cold wind came in. 
Rocky stepped off the boat and tied it up. I wonder where he learned how to do something like that. I stepped off too and felt the boat rock as I left it. Fog was coming in low, slow, to the point of creeping up past our knees. I watched the fog for what felt like minutes. Then I came up from behind Rocky and grabbed his hand. He kept his back to me, but he let me hold his hand like that. I'm still afraid of the dark, he said, and it was like he was telling me something. But before I could figure out what that was, I heard screaming. It was Jackie. I let go of Rocky's hand and went toward the screaming. I caught the words, effing asshole, then stopped and looked back at Rocky like, what are you waiting for? Rocky turned around and headed back toward the boat. When I found them, Jackie was walking away from Harvey, every few steps picking up rocks and throwing them at him. Harvey was on the ground with a bottle in his lap, his head swinging top heavy. That's when I saw the resemblance, and I didn't know how I hadn't noticed it before. Harvey was Rocky's older brother. Come on, Jackie said to me. Piece of shit, she said, and spun on the ground towards Harvey. We made our way up the incline that led to the stairs to the prison's entrance. What happened, I said. Nothing. What did he do? I said. I told him not to. Then he did. I told him to stop. Jackie rubbed at one of her eyes hard. It doesn't effing matter. Come on, she said, and started to walk faster. I let Jackie go ahead. I stopped and held the rail at the top and held the rail at the top of the stairs next to the lighthouse. I thought to look back to find Rocky. They then heard my sister yell for me to catch up. When we got back to our cell block, our mom was very sleeping. Something felt wrong about the way she was lying. She was on her back, but she always slept on her f stomach. Her sleep seemed too deep. She was positioned like she hadn't meant to fall asleep the way she had, and she was snoring. Jackie went to sleep in the cell across from us, and I slid under the blankets with my mom. The wind had picked up inside. I was afraid and unsure about everything that had just happened, but we were still... What were we still even doing on the island? But I fell asleep almost as soon as I closed my eyes. I woke up with Jackie right next to me. At some point, Jackie had taken her mom's place. The sun came in on us, making bar-shaped shadows across our bodies. After that, we did nothing every day but find out what the meals were and when they would be served. We stayed on the island because there was no other choice. There was no house or life to go back to, no hope that maybe we would get what we were asking for, that the government would have mercy on us, spare our throats by sending boats of food and electricians, builders and contractors to fix the place up. The days passed, just passed, and nothing happened. The boats came and went with fewer and fewer supplies. There was a boat at some point, and I saw some people pulling copper wire out of the walls of the buildings, carrying the bundles down to the boats. The men looked more tired and more drunk more often, and there were fewer and fewer women and children around. We're gonna get out of here, don't you two worry, our mom said to us one night from across the shell. But I no longer trusted her. I was unsure of whose side she was on, or if there was even sides anymore. Maybe there were only sides like there were sides on the rocks at the edge of the island.
On one of our last days on the island, me and my mom went up to the uh, to the lighthouse. She told me she wanted to look at the city. She said she had something to tell me. There were people running around like they did in those last days. Like the world was ending. But me and my mom sat there on the grass like nothing at all was happening. Opa Viola, baby girl, my mom said, and moved some hair behind my ear. She never, not once, called me baby girl. You have to know what's going on here, she said. You're old enough to know now, and I'm sorry I haven't told you before, Opal. You have to know that we should never not tell our stories, and that no one is too young to hear. We're all here because of a lie. They've been lying to us since they came. They're lying to us now. The way she said the lie to us now scared me. Like it had two different meanings, and I didn't know either one was. I asked my mom what the lie was, but she just stared off toward the sun, her whole face being a squint. I didn't know what to do except to sit there and wait to see what she would say. A cold wind laid into our face, making us, made us close our eyes to it. With my eyes closed, I asked my mom what we were going to do. She told me she could only do what she could do, and that the monster that was the machine that was the government had no intention of slowing itself down for long enough to truly look back to see what happened, to make it right. And so what we could do had everything to do with being able to understand where we came from, what happened to our people, and how to honor them by living right, by telling our stories. She told me that the world was made of stories, nothing else, just stories, and stories about stories. And then, as if all of it was leading up to what she was going to say next, my mom paused a long pause, looked off toward the city, and told me that she had cancer. The whole island disappeared then, everything. I stood up and walked away without knowing where to. I remember I left two shoes over by the rocks all that time before. When I got to two shoes, he was on his side and in bad shape, like something had chewed on him, or like the wind and salt had dimmed him down. I picked him up and looked at, looked at his face. I couldn't see the shine in his eyes anymore. I put him back down like, like he'd been, left him like that. When we got back to the mainland, on a sunny day months after we first left for the island, we got on a bus and went back over near where we lived before we moved to the yellow house, just outside downtown Oakland on Telegraph. We stayed with our mom's adopted brother, Ronald, whom we first met the day we got to his house to live with him. Me and Jackie didn't like him one bit. My mom said he was the real deal, a medicine man. Mom didn't want to do what the doctors recommended. For a while, we went up north all the time, where Ronald would run sweats. It was too hot in there for me, but Jackie went in with Mom. Me and Jackie both told her that she should do what the doctor said to do. She told us she couldn't, and that she could only go the way she'd been going. And that was the way she went slowly receding into the past like all those sacred and beautiful and forever lost things. One day, she just holed up there on the couch in Ronald's living room. She got smaller and smaller. After Alcatraz, our mom died. I kept my head down. I focused on school. Our mom had always told us the most important thing we could do was to get educated and that people won't listen to you otherwise. We didn't end up staying at Ronald's all that long. Things went real bad, real fast. But that's a story for another time. When she was there, and even after she died, for a while he left us to ourselves. Me and Jackie spent all our time together when we worked at school. We went to see mom's grave as often as we could. One day on the way home from the center, Jackie stopped and turned to me. What are we doing, she said. Going home, I said. What home, Jackie said. I don't know, I said. What are we going to do? I don't know. Usually have some smartest answer. Just keep going, I guess. I'm pregnant, Jackie said. What? Fucking piece of sh Oops, effing piece of shit. Harvey, remember? What? It doesn't matter. I can just get rid of it. No, you can't just get... 
rid of. I know someone. My friend Adriana's brother knows someone in West Oakland. Jackie, you can't. Then what? We raised the baby together with Ronald? No, Jackie said, then started to cry. Like she hadn't cried at the funeral. She stopped, put her hand on top of a parking meter, then looked away from me. She wiped her arm across her face one face once hard, then kept walking. We walked like that for some time, the sun behind us, our shadow slanted, stretched ahead of us. One of the last things mom said to me when we were over there, she said she w shouldn't ever not tell our stories, it said. What the F is that supposed to mean? I mean having the baby. It's not a story, old pal. This is real. It could be both. Life doesn't work out the way stories do. Mom's dead. She's not coming back. And we're alone. Living with a guy we don't even know who we're supposed to call uncle. What kind of a effed up story is that? Yeah, mom's dead. I know. We're alone. But we're not dead. It's not over. We can't just give up, Jackie. Right? Jackie didn't respond at first. We kept walking, passing all the storefronts at Piedmont Avenue. We listened to the constant lapping sounds of cars passing by, like the sound of waves amongst the rocks on the shore of our, of our uncertain future in an Oakland that would never be the same as it was. For mom up and left on a jagged wind. We came to a red light. When I turned green, Jackie reached down and took my hand. And when we got to the other side of the street, she didn't let go. I'm on the toilet, but nothing's happening. I'm here. You have to try. You have to intend and not only tell yourself. Wait, hold on. This is Edwin Black. Give me a second, I'm gonna quickly scan through this. This is also a part that I read before, I'm gonna skip maybe.
Okay. <sighs> I'm really tired. Hold on. I'll take a quick break again. I'll come back.
mean, I'm probably gonna go for, let's see. Two more chapters. Oops, sorry. Bill Davis, Calvin Johnson. Wait. Bill Davis, Calvin Johnson, and then we'll stop here. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Bill moves the bleachers with a slow thoroughness of one who's had a job too long. He slogs along, plods, but not without pride. So Bill is the step bro, step dad of Ed. He immerses himself in his job. He likes to have something to do, to feel useful, even if that work, that job is currently in maintenance. He is picking up garbage missed by the initial post game crew. It's a job for the old guy that they can't fire because he's been there so long. He knows. Lee also knows. He means more than that to him. Because they don't count on him to cover their shifts? Wasn't he available any day of the week for any shift? Didn't he know the ins and outs of that Coliseum better than anyone? Hadn't he done almost every single available job over all the years he's worked there, from security, where he started, all the way to peanut vendor, a job he's only done once and hated? He tells himself he means more. He tells himself he can tell himself and believe it. But it's not true. There's no room here for old people like Bill anymore. Anywhere. Bill makes an arc like the bill of a hat with his hand and puts it on his forehead to block the sun. He wears light blue latex gloves, holds his trash grabber in one hand and a clear gray garbage bag in the other. He stops what he's doing. He thinks he sees something come over the top rim of the stadium. A small thing, an unnatural movement, definitely not a seagull. Bill shakes his head, spits on the ground, then steps on the spit, pivots, then squints to try to see what is, what it is up there. His phone vibrates in his pocket. He pulls it out and sees that it's his girlfriend Karen. No doubt it's about her man-boy son, Edwin. Lately, she's been calling all the time about him, mostly about him needing rides to and from work. Bill can't stand the way she babies him, can't stand the 30-odd-year-old baby he is, can't stand what the youth are allowed to become these days, coddled babies, all of them, with no trace of skin, no toughness left. There's something wrong about it, something about the ever-present phone glow on their faces, or the too fast way they tap their phones, their gender fluid fashion choices, their hyper PC gentle way of being while lacking all social graces and old world manners and politeness. Edwin's this way too, tech savvy sure, but when it comes to the real cold hard gritty world outside beyond the screen, without the screen, he's a baby. So he's very conservative for sure. Yes, things look bad these days. Everyone's talk everyone talks like it's getting better and that and that just makes it all the worse that it's still so bad. It's the same with his own life. Karen tells him to stay positive, but you have to achieve positivity in order to maintain it. He loves her though, all the way, and he tries. He really tries to see it as being okay. It just seems like young people have taken over the place. Sorry. Even the old people in charge, they're acting like kids. There's no more scope, no vision, no depth. We want it now and we want it new. This world is a mean curveball thrown by an overly excited, steroid-fueled kid pitcher. 
who no more cares about the integrity of the game than he does about the Costa Ricans, who painstakingly stitch the balls together by hand. The field is set up for baseball. The grass is so short it doesn't move. It's the oak cork stillness of the center of a baseball. The grass is chalked with straight lines that separate foul and fair that reach out to the stands and back toward the infield where the players play the game, where they pitch and swing and steal and tag, where they signal and hit and strike and ball, score runs, where they sweat and wait in the shade of the dugout, just chewing and spitting until all the innings run out. Bill's phone rings again. This time he answers. Karen, what is it? I'm working. I'm so sorry to bother you at work, honey, but Edwin needs to be picked up later. He just can't, you know, after what happened to him on the bus. You know how I feel about it. Bill, please, just do it this time. I'll have a talk with him later. I'll let I'll let him know you can't he can't count on you anymore. Cameron says, Count on you anymore. Bill hates the way she can turn it on him, which is a few choice of words. Don't put it like that. Put it on him. He needs to be able to make it on his own now. He's at least he's got a job now. He's working every day. That's a lot for him. Please, I don't want to discourage him. The goal is to get out, get him out there on his own, remember? And then we can talk about how, about you being able to move in finally, Karen says. Her voice is sweet now. Okay, really? Thanks, hun. And if you can pick up a box of Franzi on the way home, the pink one, we're out. You owe me tonight, Bill says, and hangs up before she can respond. Bill looks around the empty stadium, appreciating the stillness. He needs this kind of stillness, clean of movement. He thinks about the incident on the bus, Edwin. It could still make Bill laugh just to think of it. He smiles a smile he can't contain. On the f on his first day of work, Edward got into it with a vet on the bus. Bill doesn't know how it started, but whatever happened, the bus driver ended up kicking both of them off the bus. Then the guy chased Edwin all the way down International in his wheelchair. Luckily, he chased him in the right direction, and Edwin made it to work on time despite getting kicked, kicked off of the bus, probably because he got chased. Bill laughs out loud, thinking about Edwin running for his life down International, making it on time to work a sweaty mess. Well, that part isn't funny, actually. That part made it sad. Bill walks by a metal surface on the east wall. He sees himself reflected there. He steadies his unstable, disoriented reflection in the dented metal paneling, straightens his shoulders, picks up his chin. That guy in the black windbreaker, whose hair is fully grayed and receded, and those and whose stomach comes out a little more each year, whose feet and knees hurt when he stands or walks too long. He's okay. He makes it. He could easily not be making it. He's almost always not been making it. It's Coliseum, the team, the Oakland athletes. Athletics had once been the most important thing in the world for Bill during that magical time for Oakland, 1972-1974, where the A's won three World Series in a row. You don't see that happen anymore. It's too much of a business now. They would never allow that. Those were strange years for Bill. Bad, awful years. He'd got... 10 back from Vietnam after going AWOL in 71, dishonorably discharged. He hated the country, and the country hated him. There were so many drugs coursing through him then, it was hard to believe he could still remember any of it. Most of all, he remembers the games. The games were all he had then. He had his teams, and they were winning, three years in a row, right when he needed it, after what felt to Bill like a lifetime of losing. Those were the years of Vita Blue, Catfish Hunter, Reggie Jackson, the bastard Charlie Finley. And then when the Raiders won in 76, two championships the San Francisco teams hadn't won yet, it was a really good time to be from Oakland. To feel that you were from that thing, that winning. He got hired at the Coliseum in 1989 after doing five years at San Quentin for stabbing a guy outside a biker bar on Fruitvale down by the railroad tracks. So he went to jail. It wasn't even Bill's knife. The stabbing was coincidental. It was self-defense. He didn't know how the knife ended up in his hand. 
Sometimes you just did things. You acted and or reacted the way you need to. The problem had been that Bill couldn't get his own story straight. The other guy had been less drunk. He had more consistent. He had a more consistent story. So Bill took the fall. It was his knife somehow in the end. He was the one with a uh, with a history of violence. The crazy AWOL Vietnam vet. But Jill had been good to Bill. He read almost the whole time he was in. He read all the Hunter S. Thompson he could get his hands on. He read Hunter's lawyer, Oscar Zeta Acosta. He loved the autobiography of a brown buffalo and the revolt of the cockroach people. He read Fitzgerald and Hemingway, Carver and Faulkner, all the drunks. He read Ken Kessie. Ken Kessie. He loved One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He was pissed when they made the movie and the native guy, who was the narrator of the whole book. He just played the crazy si silent, stoic Indian who threw the sink through the window at the end. He read Richard Branton, Jack London. He read history books, biographies, books about the prison system, books about baseball, football, California native history. He read Stephen King and Elmer Leonard. He read and kept his head down. Let the years dissolve the way they could when you could, when you were somewhere else inside them, in a book, on the block, in a dream. Another good year that came out of bad times for Bill was 1989 when the A's swept the San Francisco Giants. When, in the middle of the World Series, just before the start of Game 3, the earth slipped, dropped, quaked. The Loma Prieta earthquake killed 63 people, or 63 people, 63 people died because of it. The Cypress Freeway collapsed, and someone drove right off the Bay Bridge, where Session had collapsed in the middle. That was the day baseball saved lives in Oakland and in the greater Bay Area. If more people had been at home, sitting around the TV, watching the game, they would have been on freeways. They would have been out in the world, world was collapsing, just falling apart. Bill looks back at the outfield, and right in front of him, floating down to his eye level, out there in the bleachers, with him, is a tiny plane. Or had Bill seen one before? He has. It's a drone. A drone plane, like they'd been flying into terrorist hideouts and caves in the Middle East. Bill, sw Bill swats at the drone with his trash grabber. The thing floats back, then turns around and floats down to where he can't see it. Hey! Bill finds he's yelling at the drone. And then he turns to walk up the stairs, up to the corridor that will get him to the stairs that led him down to the field. When he gets to the top of the stairs to the first deck, plaza infield, he pulls out his binoculars, scans the field for the drone, and finds it. He walks down the stairs, tries to keep it in his scope, but it's hard while walking. The binoculars shake, and the thing keeps moving. Bill sees that it's headed for a home plate. He skips down the stairs. He hasn't gotten moving this fast in years, maybe decades. Bill can see it with his eyes now. He's running, trash grabber in his hand. He'll destroy the thing. Bill still has fight, grit, hot blood running. He can still move. He steps onto the brown red dirt. The drone is at home base. It's turning toward Bill as he runs toward it. He readies his trash grabber, raises it in the air behind him. But the drone sees him just as it gets in range. It flies back. Bill gets a hit in and sets the thing wobbly for a moment. He lifts his trash grabber again, comes down hard, and misses entirely. The drone flies straight up, quickly, 10 and 20, 50 feet in seconds. Bill gets his binoculars back, watches the drone fly out over the rim of the Coliseum. How long is Calvin? Oh, not too long, actually. I'm going to get my water quickly.
One more chapter to get through. Here we go. When I got home from work, I found Sonny and Maggie waiting for me at the kitchen table with my dinner made set and set. Maggie's my sister. I'm just living here until I can save enough. But I like being around her and her daughter. It's like being back at home. Home like we can't have it anymore. Since our dad left, just disappeared. Really, he didn't... Really, he had been there all along. But her mom acted like he did. Like him leaving was the end. It wasn't really about any him or any of us. She's been undiagnosed for too long. That's what Maggie said. Being bipolar is like having an axe to grind with an axe. You need to split the wood to keep you warm in a cold forest. You only might eventually realize you'll never make your way out of. That's the way Maggie put it. She got it like me and my mother and my brother did it. But she's medicated, managed. Man, Maggie, she's like the key to the history of our lives. Me and my brother Charles, we hate and love her like you end up feeling about anyone nearest to you who you've got. Maggie made meatloaf and mashed potato. Broccoli, the usual. We ate in silence for a while. Then Sonny kicked me in the shin under the table, hard, then played it straight kept eating her dinner. I played it straight too. This is good, Maggie. Tastes like mom's. Isn't this good, Sonny? I said, then smiled at Sonny. Sonny didn't smile back. I leaned into a bite, held it over my plate, then tapped Sonny in the shin with my foot. Sonny broke a smile, then laughed because she'd broken a smile. She kicked me again. Okay, Sonny, Maggie said. Go get us all some napkins. I got that lemonade you like, Maggie said to me. Thanks, I'ma get a beer though. You still got some, right? And so, Maggie's a sister, Sonny's a daughter. Thanks, I'ma get a beer though. We still got some, right? I said. I got up and opened the fridge, thought better about the beer, then got out the lemonade. Maggie didn't see that I didn't get a beer. You can get that. You can get that lemonade I got for us, though, she said. You're going to tell me what I can and can't do now, I said, and wanted to not have said it right away. Sonny got up and ran out of the kitchen. Next thing I heard was the screen door opening and closing. I got up with Maggie and went to the front room, thinking Sonny had maybe run out the front door. Instead, there was her brother right in the living room with his homie Carlos, his shadow, his twin. The sight of them... Maggie turned around and went to Sonny's room, where I should have followed her. They both had 40s in their hands. They sat down in the living room with the cool and cruel indifference of guys who know you owe them something. I, I knew he'd show up eventually. I called him a few weeks before to let him know I would get him the money I owed, but that I needed more time. Maggie let me stay with her on the condition that I stayed away from my brother Charles. But here he was. Charles cut a mean figure at six foot four, two forty, with broad shoulders and big ass hands. Charles Chucks Charles Chucks went up on the coffee table. Carlos put his feet up too, turned the TV on. Have a seat, Calvin, Charles said to me. I'm good, I said. Are you though? Carlos said, clicking through channels. It's been a while, Charles said. It's been a long effing while, would I, while I would say. Where you been? Vacation? Must be nice, hiding out like this. Home-cooked meals, kid running around, playing house with our effing sister. What the F is that? I have to say, I can't help but wonder where all that money you're saving goes. With you being up in here rent-free, right? You know you're not paying rent, Carla said. But you got a job. Charles said. You're making money. That money should be my effing pocket money yesterday. Should be in my effing pocket yesterday. In Octavio's. You're lucky you're my little brother, you know that? You're lucky I haven't told no one I know where the eff you run off to. But I can only take so much of that shit. I told you I'd have it. Why you gotta come out and announce and shit? 
keep acting like you don't didn't have something to do with that shit at the powwow. I got and robbed in the parking lot before I could even go in. I shouldn't have brought the shit with me, the pound I had in it. But then I wasn't sure if I did bring it. Or did Charles put in my glove box? I was smoking too much then. My memory was an effing slide shit that happened to me went down and didn't come back up from. Okay, you got me. Hit the nail on the effing head. I should never have left. You're right. I should hustle and pay Octavio back for some shit I got stolen from me by his homies. So thank you. You're really helping me out here, brother. But I can't help but wonder why you told me I should go check out that powwow at Laney. See about our native heritage and shit. You said mom would have wanted us to go. You said you would meet me there. And I can't help but wonder if you didn't know where the, what the F was coming from me in the parking lot. What I can't get my head around is why. What's your interest? Is it to keep me around because I was talking about giving that shit up? Or did your stupid ass smoke all that shit up and need mine to not come up short? Charles stood and took a step forward toward me, then stopped and made his hands into fists. I opened my hands and raised them in a take it easy gesture, then took two steps back. Charles took another step toward me, then looked over to Carlos. Let's go for a drive, he said to Carlos, who stood and turned off the TV. I watched them walk out in front of me. I looked back down the hall toward Tony's room. My right eye twitched involuntarily. Let's go, I heard Charles say out from front. Charles drove a dark blue custom-made four-door Chevy El Camino. Camino. The thing was clean, like he just washed it after noon, which he probably did. Girls, guys like Charles were always washing their cars, keeping the shoes and hats clean as new. Before Charles started the car, he fired up a blunt and passed it to Carlos. We took two hits off it, then passed it back up. We drove down San Leandro Boulevard down deep into deep East Oakland. I didn't recognize the beat that was playing. Something slow and bassy. Something that came mostly from beneath the back seat from the subwoofer. I noticed Charles and Carlos were just barely nodding their heads to the music. Neither of them would ever admit that they were dancing, bobbing their heads like that, but they were kind of dancing, dancing in the smallest possible way, but dancing, and I thought that was, it was hella funny, and I almost laughed, but then realized a few minutes later that I was doing it with them, and it wasn't funny, and I realized how high it was. This was some other shit. What they smoked could have been effing angel dust sprinkled on. They called that caging. Shit, knowing them, that's exactly why I couldn't stop my head from bobbing, and why the street lights were so effing bright and mean seeming and like too red. I was glad I only hit it once. We wound up in the kitchen of someone's house. The walls were all bright yellow. Muffled mariachi music boomed through the room from the backyard. Charles gestured for me to sit down at the table I had to slide beneath. Like Booth, with Carlos to my left, tapping his fingers to get some other beat he was hearing in his own head. Charles was across from me, staring right at me. You know where we're at? I'm guessing somewhere Octavio might end up being at, but I don't know why the F you would think this was a good idea. Charles laughed a fake laugh. Remember that time we went over to Demond Park and we went through that long sewer tunnel? We ran through it, and at some point, there was no light, just the sound of the rushing water, and we didn't know where the F it came from or where it was going. We had to jump over it. You remember we heard a voice, and then you thought someone grabbed your leg, and you squealed like a little effing baby pig, and you almost fell in it, but I pulled you back and jumped, and we ran out there together, Charles said, sliding a bottle of tequila on the table in front of him back and forth. I'm trying to get you into position of being grabbed, Charles said, and stopped sliding the bottle. He gripped it, held it still. When Octavio sees your face, 
it's gonna be like that and I'm gonna pull you back save you from being taken down that long tube to nowhere you ain't getting out of this shit alone you feel me Carlos put his arm around me and I tried to shrug it off Charles leaned back and let his big arms fall to his side right on cue Octavia walked into the kitchen his eyes turned into bullets he shot them around the room what the f is this Charlos that's why Octavia called Charles, Charles and Carlos because they were always together and they looked alike. It was a way to put them in their place, to make them know they were both equally less important than him. Octavio, who stood six foot six with a barrel chest and muscular arms you could see even through the triple extra large black t-shirt he always wore. Octavio, Charles said, take it easy. I'm just trying to remind him what's the what, what's what. Don't trip. He's gonna pay. He's my little brother, Octavio. No disrespect. No disrespect, man. I just want him to know. Know what? No disrespect. What is that, Charles? I don't think you even know. Octavio pulled out an all-white magnum from the front of his belt and pointed it at my face while looking at Charles. What the f kind of game do you think you're playing here, Octavio said, looking at Charles but talking to me. You take. Then you owe. You don't pay. You lose the shit. I don't give a F how you lost it. It's gone. Then you disappear and show up in my uncle's effing kitchen. You're effing crazy, Charles. I came here to have a good time. But because you got all my shit stolen, because your brother smoked all this shit up, you both owe me. And I got into this shit with who I get the shit from. And now I owe. Then we're all left if we don't make some real money real soon. Otago kept the gun pointed at me. Smoked all, all his shit up. What the F? I stared down the barrel of the gun. I went into it. I'm almost done. Two pages. I stared down the barrel of the gun. I went into it, straight into the tunnel of it. I saw the way it had to go down. Octavia was going to turn around to the countertop behind him to get a drink. Then Charles would shoot up out of his chair and put Octavia in a chokehold from behind. The gun would drop to the ground in the struggle. And Charles, he would hold him there, turn them both around. And trying to suddenly be a good brother, he'd yell at me. Get the F out of here. But I wouldn't leave. I'd know just what to do. I'd grab the gun on the floor. I'd pick up the gun and point it at Octavio's head and look at Charles. Give me the gun, Calvin. Get the F out of here, Charles would say. I'm not leaving, I'd tell him. Shoot him then, Charles would say. Then me and Octavio would catch eyes. I noticed for the first time that Octavio's eyes were green. And look into those eyes so long it made Octavio mad and he slammed Charles back into the cupboards. Then I'd tell him all how they were going to make Octavio drink and that he was going to drink until he couldn't stand up anymore. I tell him that if they made him drink enough, he wouldn't remember shit. We'd make the blackout so bad, it would go forward and backward in time, swallow the night. My eyes were closed. For a second, I wondered if I might still be in the car, dreaming the scene from the back seat. It was a night like so many others I'd had before. Maybe I'd wake up in the back seat. We'd go home and I'd get back to my life I was trying to make that didn't include any of this. I opened my eyes. Octavia was still holding the gun. But he was laughing. Charles started to laugh too. Octavia set the gun on the table and they hugged. The two of them. Charles and Octavio. Then Carlos got up and shook hands with Octavio. These are the pieces you had made? Charles said to Octavio, picking up the white gun. Nah, this one's special. Remember David? Manny's little brother. He made them in his effing basement. The rest just look like nines. Go on, tell them, Octavio said to Charles, looking at me. Remember when I told you about the Lanny powwow? And you said you wanted to go because there was that big one coming up at the Oakland Coliseum and that you were on the power committee for work. Remember that, Charles said? Yeah, I said. Remember what else you told me? No, I said. About the money, Charles said. Money, I said. You said there would be something like $50,000 in cash price there that day, Charles said. And how easy it would be to steal. I was joking, Charles. You think I would... Rob the people I work with and then think I can get away with it? It was a joke. That's funny, Octavio said. Charles lifted his head toward Octavio like, 
What's up? That anyone would think you would rob the people you work with and think you could get away with it. That's funny to me, Italia said. This is how we make it right, Charles said. You'll get a cut too, and then we'll be good, right, Octavio? Octavio nodded his head. Then he picked up the tequila bottle. Let's drink, he said. So we drank. We went through half the bottle, shot after shot. Before the last shot, there was a pause. Octavio looked up at me, then lifted his shot glass toward me, and gestured for me to get up. We took the shot, just me and him. Then he gave me a hug I forgot to return. While he hugged me, I saw Charles look at Carlos like he didn't like what was happening. After Octavio let me go, he turned around and got another bottle of tequila from the top cupboard. Then he sort of laughed at who knows what and stumbled across the left and then left the kitchen. Charles lifted his head up to me like, let's go. On the way to the car, we saw a kid on the bike watching everyone from far off. I could tell Charles was almost going to say something to him. Then Carlos tried to punk him by acting like he was going to hit him. The kid didn't flinch. He just kept staring at the house. His eyes were hella droopy, but not just like he was high or drunk. I thought about Sloth from the Goomies. And then I thought about the movie I saw one Saturday morning when I was like five or six. It was about a kid who woke up blind one day. Before, I never thought about the idea that you could just wake up to some terrible stuff. Some terrible shift in what you thought life was. And that's what I felt like then, taking the shots, Octavio's embrace, agreeing to some doomed as planned. I wanted to say something to the kid on his bike. I don't know why. There was nothing to say. We got in the car and rode home in silence. The low sound of the engine and road leading us towards something that we'd never make our way back from. Okay, I'm going to stop there now. Thank you guys for listening and we'll continue.